Hi everyone, welcome back. I'm Brady Volt, founder of NimbleThis and The Volt Firm. Today our presentation is on softwareization of the cable industry. With me is Tadaus Chizewski, Chief Technology and Innovation Officer based out of Poland. Tadaus, welcome back with us. Hi Brady, thank you for inviting me. It's nice to be here. Nice to have you with us, Tom. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your company and where you're based from? Sure. Um, I'm working for Falcon V Systems. That's the, the company that is based in Poland. We are joint venture between um, the Polish company, Vector Group, and uh, Liberty Global Ventures. And last year, we were able also to take on board uh, or try to join our uh, company and the shareholder uh, of our company. So. We are almost majority of, of, of our shareholders are the cable operators. Uh, we are a software company building the um, ecosystem for the for the cable, um, trying to achieve interoperability and convergence inside the uh, inside the, the, the cable uh, systems for FMA or I would say for whole DAA, so this this distributed access architecture. Um, we don't produce any hardware. Uh, we are relying on the third party um, vendors like RPD or RMD. Um, so that's in overall, we are the software company. We, we build software and only software to provide the reliability, the speed and agility uh, inside, the, inside the cable operations. Thanks, no, that's a, that's a great introduction. I have, um, I think you and I first met at uh, an Angacom show years ago. Uh, it was a dinner with some friends of ours. And and then, you know, you and I started talking. I've learned a lot of information about RPDs and the underlying technology of, um, from, from you specifically. Um, and that, I think, leads us into an interesting discussion because, as you said, you do software. And that is, I think, very interesting a very interesting discussion on how we can go into where the cable industry is evolving and, and basically how we're moving in an industry. And I think it all starts around DAA, as you mentioned. So, you know, you've done a lot of work in RPDs. The cable industry is, is moving very heavily and very quickly into a, a virtualized environment where, you know, we have virtual CMTSs. I'll be giving a discussion about that later on. And, the, you know, these CMTSs as well, you know, ICM, integrated CMTSs and DCMTSs and virtual CMTSs, these now can all communicate with these remote FI devices or RPDs. This really changes things. How we communicate with those and how we set up the infrastructure involves a lot of software. And that has a unique component that we're going to talk about today for cable operators, this sort of software disaggregation of the entire communications industry and how we both as you know, software developers and, and industry veterans start to work with cable operators and, and help them understand how that technology works from a day-to-day -day environment really can bring new challenges in. Deploying VCMTSs, deploying RPDs, managing, monitoring those, this brings new technologies in and, and changes the pace of how we can deploy those. At the same time, it brings in new technologies and, and new platforms that we do that. So how we manage these, how we scale these, these are all new technologies. And I'd, I'd like to, to get a little better understanding from you, to do on you know, what you see, how you're managing this, and, and what we see as challenging from these. So I'll open a table to you for what key challenges you see cable operators moving forward in this new world. Okay, uh, so you touch on a lot of points. Yeah, and everything for cable uh, starts with DA itself because the first and most important part was actually taking out the five from the, from the classical CCAP. Uh, ECMTS and uh, possibility to, to extract that fun specific function and move it outside the, the chassis itself allows to start disaggregating and changing the a lot of proprietary hardware, uh, ASIC boards uh, to use more, uh, uni I would say, general uh, commodity of the shelf, uh, CPUs. 
Mm, and on those CPUs, we started to run uh, the same function for the Mac, uh, only on in CPU, not, not on FPGA or, or ASICs. Uh, but the file, extracting the file that, at least for now, I don't know if in the future, I don't think so, uh, cannot be done in CPU. That's still need to be a, that specific element need to be done in, in um, specific uh, silicon um, proprietary most of the time, but maybe in future SDR will resolve that. Um, so that was the, the first step. So actually defining the DAA and possibility to extract that was, I would say, foundation to be able to start do a standardization across the hardware on which we run the, the, the Mac functions that are able to provide the services. And that was in NHL remote file as, as a first. Uh, lately, there is also the, the FMA for last uh, lately four or five years, we are also building the, the FMA itself uh, in cable apps, the specification. This is, uh, has a, a, a little different approach where only the specific management elements are take out from the from the EC cap and put it on the cloud itself. But nevertheless, the, the number of software uh, and active devices with uh, rapidly changing software uh, in MSO environment is raising. So in, in older days, you had like one CCAP that was providing service for 64 service group, and it was connected to some analog uh, optics. Uh, of course, on that analog optics, there was some software firmware, but it wasn't changing very often. Right now, you deploy very a lot of active devices into the field. And when I say active, there is a, a huge software running on them, whatever it is, RPD and RMD. Of course, RMD is more complex. Um, but there is a lot of changing things. Like you have an operating system in the nodes. In, in all the days, you have like analog node. There was a very small firmware. Right now, we have a whole stack of, of software of operating system uh, a lot of memory and movie components. So there is a lot of change how we manage those functions and how we need to start thinking about what's happening in the network itself. So yeah, it's it's changing. We, we are adding more and more of software that is rapidly changing. We can provide a new, uh, new version every two weeks, every month. Of course, some cloud providers are able to provide every hour, but in, in specific do, our domain, I think that's that's too extreme, but maybe in future it's going to be also similar. But nevertheless, the software itself is more often deployed deeper in the network, more intelligent uh, nodes. So there are new challenges that, are, that brings a huge flexibility and uh, potential for new values and new features for the end customers, the ops. Uh, but it also brings a complexity, how to manage such a sophisticated system. And, and, just, uh, and, and just so we're all on the same page, we understand the software that you're talking about, what, I mean, what is the activity that the software is actually doing? So if we take out the, the CCAP and we can look at the slide, if you look at the, the classical CCAP, um, the, most of the time, this is a huge chassis with some line cards. There are some um, ASICs board line cards supervisor Etc. There is a there is a lot of proprietary hardware uh, and proprietary software. And when I'm I'm saying that the, there is more software, if we go to the next stage where we we are taking the the remote file deeper in the field, actually we add the file that is RPD that is running here deep in the field. So we are we are actually adding to the node that is in the field additional layer. Uh, of sorry, additional software components that are managing this particular physical function in that case node. So we we see that um, the the Mac itself stays in the probably in the hub. Uh, of course, there are some edge computing scenarios where, with the gap, but stays in the hub in head end, and the Mac execution of the Mac is running on uh, classical uh, on COTS CPU. Uh, the same CPU that we can find in laptops uh, or other uh, personal computers, sometimes a, a little modified, uh, more more powerful, but nevertheless, the architecture is very similar to what we have. So um, those components connecting with data plane processing, the management of, of, the, of the, the chassis itself, management plane, that lands on the CPU. 
The, the file itself is still on the specific ASIC that are deep in the field in our RPDs, and, but you still need to have a software to manage them. And looking at this, uh, what you're presenting, we had, normally we had uh, in the ASIC app or CMTS, we had one, just one big box uh, and the vendor was uh, taking care of everything, integrated everything as a whole black box that was provided just to the MSO itself. Now we're gonna have two active devices talking to each other. And when I say two, that's not really true. If we look at the same scale, the same virtual CMTS running on one server can have like 64 RPDs in the field talking to the to virtual CMTS. So actually we're gonna have 65, at least 65 active software stack and 65 active devices that are talking to each other. For remote file, of course, we are using a set of protocols like GCP, LTTP, where the RPD is communicating with Vcore to manage all the configuration of the file. And the DOCSIS layer is still, or that is running on the CPU, is talking to, directly to the cable modems um, going past through the, the file itself. Yeah? Sure. So so really, I mean, the, if we think about this from a classical or either like classical CMTS, legacy CMTS, we had one big box, one monolithic application running on that CMTS. Now what, what you're showing in these diagrams is the software you're talking about is we're replacing that monolithic application with sort of many small software applications, microservices, so to speak, that are doing the same job as that monolithic application that was running on the legacy or classical CMTS. That's true, uh, and we can go even to extreme if if we look at the FMA, um, the, the CMTS itself uh, has this notion that you still run all the subscriber database inside the CMTS, but when you look at the, the FMA itself with the RMDs in the field and the Mac Manager running in the, in the head end, you could have a situation when actually you get much more software stacks, like database that is counting all the information that is coming from RMDs on external um, uh, API that's coming from RMD to the subscriber database. You don't, don't push that to Mac Manager. Mac Manager just downloads that. You have a, sys, a syslog systems. You have a monitoring system. All those elements are actually are required to be able to monitor and manage and have visibility of what's happening in, the, in the, such a deployment. Similar thing, of course, you're going to have with remote file. But the, the FMA itself actually allows even more to disaggregate where the particular software components and functions are, are deployed. So actually the subscriber database is very interesting uh, concept where all the information coming from RMD are actually not pushed to Mac Manager. Mac Manager could, could be a very thin layer that is just orchestrate, orchestrate or control a thousand, 10,000 RMDs that are in the field. And on top of that Mac manager, you have a specific application that, as you mentioned, microservice. Microservice that is just configuring RMD in a specific way or just part of the of RMD is configured by this specific uh, application. Uh, like uh, there is a lot of things to manage the file itself. That sh could be a separate application that can be provided from an external vendor. So it opens also a a, a nice concept where you could really have a situation when the Mac manager is this layer of abstraction and on top of it, you have like 10 different vendors that are providing microservice that is doing something on RMDs. Each is coming from small company or big company and provide a value. And here, for example, innovation comes in place where actually you can accelerate there is a small company that is able very fast to build something, provide to you, uh, to, to MSO, and MSO say, well, that that's meet my requirements. I can buy from you for some small amount, but in scale, of course, that's going to be a huge revenue. Uh, application that's, I don't know, do optimization for um, downstream profiles, for example. That could be a, yeah. uh, be a case. Yeah? But, yeah, we call these nimble companies, I, and I really like nimble companies. <laughs> <laughs> I happen yeah, to have one myself. Sure. <laughs> so, yeah. so I, I, so I really get where you're going here. Um, you know, cable operators, uh, and there's pros and cons here, right? It, with the classical CMTS, we have one nice piece of monolithic software. There's benefits to that, right? It's easy. It's easy to manage for the cable operator, but there's also limitations because you don't have these benefits as you're talking about where you can have multiple vendors contributing um, 
to, you know, maybe adding new technologies that we maybe would not have had before. Maybe we could have like PNM running on the CMTS uh, as an example. Um, so, so now we have cable operators that are almost becoming like, you know, mini software companies. They have to manage all these different software stacks that are running on, on our new CMTSs that we have in the future. They have to manage RPDs. The code is running on RPDs, and, and we, we know cable operators are already dealing with that today. What are, what are the challenges? Um, how, how do cable operators get their arms around this, you know, sort of being like mini software companies and having to manage all these different software stacks that are running mm -hmm. on their CMTSs? Even, I mean, even just the standpoint of managing RPDs and bringing up RPDs, let alone these newer software solutions that they could have running on top. That's a tough question because you're asking how they manage. Um, it depends where you look, but uh, it is challenging because it, it's the the main, from my point of view, the, the main problem is about how the how the structure of the company is providing a possibility to deliver some working solution, um, and second is actually the skill gap. Um, Maybe to the I will I will start with the second one the skill gap. From my point of view, this the skill gap itself is like most of the MSOs need to be aware that the network engineers, architects, and people that manage their the whole network should stop doing the manual work. They start as you mentioned they need to start building a, a product rather than project where they execute something. And that requires actually a new skill set. Uh, a lot of automation uh, requires coding. And of course, you don't have to learn coding on very high level, very sophisticated. There is a way where uh, network engineers can start learning the basic uh, language that helps automate those processes. Um, Python or Go, uh, Golang uh, is an example of it. Um, there is even the uh, the Cisco the, the the big I would say one of the biggest or, or if not the biggest uh, switch providers routers etc in the market has its own huge school or I would say platform where network engineers the typical people that were configuring the devices etc are learning how to automate things how to build the pipelines how to use APIs on on specific uh, platforms to build software stack that are able to manage that, execute the reconfiguration, uh, deploying the configuration, uh, those types of things. But that requires actually a new skill set for the network engineers, the, the people that normally run those CMTSs and, and the CCAPs uh, to start learning and utilize uh, or remove, stop using CLI, please stop using CLI. and. If possible, don't use uh, scripts where you are using CLI. You could, but start doing that because most of the time that's a very specific, very close for each system. You have like very specific close solution. It's not optimal, but even even if you have that, that's that's good. But don't do, for example, any manual work on on those platforms. That that's completely change of the mindset itself. How how you manage that. How how you build uh, how you build, build your system, and uh, the problem with most of the of cable MSOs, I don't say problem. I'll, maybe I will phrase it as a challenge. Is that very often we have like engineering, architecture, quality assurance, and then we have an ops. And as you show on the on the diagram, uh, it is very waterfall. Like uh, it. It takes a very long time to achieve a working solution. And the, the silos between the teams do a very high overflow. The, the time between one team getting the information about what needs to be done, to another one uh, is taking a lot, a lot of time. And that makes the, the system, well, the lead times for delivering any working system when you are doing software is very, 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 very long. And to be able to, to change that, actually to be able to work faster, you need to start building, I would say, horizontal silos uh, where the, the architecture, the quality, the ops, and ops are the most important team from my perspective, because ops very often, the 
field ops and ops that are running the system are the last people that take a look at the system. The new system that is provided, new application that is provided, new remote file, FMA, whatever. And what ops do? Ops are responsible to have a quality and stable system that doesn't crash. So first thing they do, they say, well, no, 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 stop, stop. We don't know what's happening here. This is very complex. It will take us six months to understand. And they de delay. That's their task. Delay the change because change is very often raising the risk of failure. So ops they are doing their job. And if they are on board early in the process of building such a, such a software or infrastructure platform, they can start learning and give a feedback about, okay, normally we have a problem with this, with this, we need a more reliable process. So most of the time, this is a changing how the structure of company works uh, to be able to, to resolve most of those problems of delivering fast pace and the software, software building inside those companies. Yeah, I mean, so we've been, I, I mean, there have been silos and organizations since I started my career 30 years ago. How do we, how do we, I mean, do we think that due to the changing or the evolving evolution of basically software itself, software technology, do, you, do we think that that is going to help break down or start to create bridges across silos within organizations? Uh, I would love to say that I hope so. yes, I would love to say yes, but I have like, I'm looking for cloud providers. The, the cloud providers, uh, they also have a data center, they have a servers, they have a switches, they have firewalls. There's also a lot of software running there, but they have a lot of infrastructure. But somehow when I, in comparison to, to MSOs, when I want a service, I just go to the, the web page or Amazon, Google, whatever. I, the one thing I need to have is credit card, and then I can build uh, a, a, a small data center for me with firewall, with load balancer, with CPUs, storage, whatever. Like Amazon web page to build uh, your own deployment is so complex, it's so huge because there is like tons of solutions you can just deploy by by instant, and there is no like web page where you talk with ops. Hey, I just need load balancer. You just you just do define it. Yeah. that, you do it, yeah? So, and this whole notion about actually changing how the how the companies works is an example of how it could work is coming from those providers. So either the MSOs will start using those principles and there are like, at least if you're having a lot of software and a lot of changing infrastructure and you have one to similar reliability, and as a cloud providers, there are some like two principles that or methodologies that you should um, use in, in your network. And we'll, I, I think we will cover that later. But um, either the MSOs will adapt to this or they will suffer. And most of the time when people suffer, they choose uh, s more simple solutions. So again, one solution from one vendor, everything is coming from, from one vendor. And that, that, uh, as you mentioned, it's convenient, yeah? And in old old days, like three years ago, I was a guy that was saying, this is good, this is bad. Uh, right now I'm saying there are, for each model of working, there are advantages and disadvantages. For this particular way, how we would like to, to work, the model where you have everything from one vendor have a huge advantage. It's very convenient. It's easy because you have a thing that's provided to you and you have just black box with probably one switch and, and you are happy. Yeah? But if you are trying to be a, able to respond to the change, bring a new feature, bring new functionality, and sometimes it's not connected with boxes. Sometimes it could be directed by the feature for the field ops, something like that. So the guy in the, in the, in the field would like to know faster what's happening in the, on, the, on the file on RPD or maybe outside the RPD itself. And then, if you don't, and if this is not in portfolio of that particular vendor, well, that's vendor luck. You, well, the AWS have... analogy is is kind of interesting that you make because there's not a lot of silos that you can run into in AWS when you pull something up. Um, you know, you 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 have to do everything at the same time. You have to create your security groups. You have to create your VM. 
um, you know, waiting for a week for IT to approve your security rules really changes the dynamics. That doesn't happen in AWS. Um, but I think that brings us into the, you know, this sort of a, the, the software development model of, of agile, agile software development versus waterfall. I think that's kind of where if we looked at how we would want to ideally do things um, or change things in the cable operator environment, it would be kind of moving into that arena. I, th I think still, you know, the, the waterfall development model is how we've typically done things where we start developing th something, we wait 18 months until it's complete, and then we say, you know, project complete, let's ship it, or let's put it into the production environment. And that's or I think on the shelf. Still, yeah, or on the shelf. Or if on it doesn't the shelf. Work. Yeah. And, and that's still the model that I see most cable operators working, you know, even in, in our software development model. We use an agile process where you know we have two week sprints. At the end of two weeks, we ha we have a product. We could actually ship that product. But mm -hmm. cable operators, um, their desire is to have uh, you know put it into pre prod, test it in pre production, and then wait for a maintenance window. Um, and then we can put that into production once everyone signs off. And that can be a very long process. And I think most people are under that process. Um, but I like. You know, maybe to hear from you from from an agile standpoint, because you mentioned this earlier, you develop very quickly. Um, let's say there's a security vulnerability out there. I know a lot of us probably lived through the security vulnerabilities of Log4j back in over the uh, the holidays and in the winter time. Uh, we had like four or five different releases of software. We could we could get ahead of security vulnerabilities much quicker and probably live in a more secure environment if we could get releases out to cable operators within days or, or, you know, really days or weeks rather than waiting for months. So what, you know, what is your perspective on that? Um, perspective is like, you know, I see sometimes the deployment and, and environment of MSOs like this. We do a release once per quarter, once per year. And if you have a new version of software, um, they say, okay, this needs to go align the, the process itself. And I understand that. But sometimes there are bugs. And when the bugs, critical bug, hit the product, hit the prod, and you need to fix it right away, then somehow you are able to bypass this process. So I wonder why, why for this particular element, we can bypass the process and we can do a, a upgrade much faster. Because nobody wants to have a, like security vulnerability for six months. I don't think that it's happening. Crashing of the line cars on the CCAPs. I don't, I'm not saying we even with remote file. I remember that uh, I used to sell, I was working for integrator. I used to sell uh, CCAPs. And I remember that in situation when there was like real fire, ops were able to say, okay, where's the new version of software that fixed that back? And they were able to deploy right away. So uh, for me, this is like a very strange situation. For some particular things, you can bypass the process. And I think the if you are coming with Azure that you are trying to uh, very often to do the change or new version of software, you mentioned the benefit of, of having a much faster releases of, for security breach, et cetera. Um, there's also another benefit for that is like smaller change going to the production probably uh, lower down the lower down the the problem uh, of finding the bug or problem where you are actually doing the deployment uh, if you batch everything in one big huge uh, new version of software and pull it out on the on the production and something doesn't work you, you change so many things in so many software stack that it's very hard to to find out what's the problem and the cloud providers actually are using not only the, I would say, agile and very often releases of, of the system, but they also use this principle for managing the infrastructure as a code, where you define everything, like I'm saying, everything that is possible by code and software stacks that are managing this particular function. And you don't have to have one big software stack that's managing everything. You could have a separate software stack that they are managing specific function. But what it does to environment uh, is like every time when the network engineer or whatever is changing something in the system, 
he doesn't do it manually. It's control version. There are some automated tests that need to be passed before you deploy. And that way, if you are, for example, doing a, let's say, new version of software and you deploy that and you just change, okay, this particular component, I want to have a new version of software on that. Rest of it stayed the same. I build new environment. Um, and let's say you're doing this deployment, you know that in this particular deployment, you only change this particular element and you, you are able to control and or reverse that very quickly or much quicker than today. Um, so that's one principle. And I think this is very, very needed right now in the uh, old telco. And I think some of the uh, communication service provider are doing that. Uh, of course, it's not easy because there's a lot of legacy systems. I'm not saying that today we need to start everything infrastructure as a code. It's hard because there are a lot of legacy systems that are need to be exchanged and need to re be removed. Sometimes it's not possible. But if you are building something new from scratch, don't lower the bar. Aim for something better in, in the longer run. So have a reliable system and Think about that the system is unreliable from day one. So you need to be able to track any change that's happening in the system. This is, and most of the time it's like new version of co new config, even new config going to CCAP is like manually interacted from Excel. I see this many times, like there is Excel from the tree. It's very common. He's just, yeah, yeah, and he's just- Copy and paste. C. Yeah, yeah, and something didn't happen and whoa, 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 it doesn't work. And now returning to the old config, where is it? how it find it in that in that environment in such an approach you're not able to reproduce for example let's say that engineer added new config and he said after the deployment something crashed and he's opening the back and saying well i added something like this config and it crashed and developer is actually trying to rep reproduce this the same problem and you cannot reproduce it Oh, because the, the, the network engineer forgot that he actually added something else from other file in, in the configuration. There was another stage or a step in the process of configuration and he forgot that. So, so even for developer to be able to reproduce what happened in the, in the production is actually speeding up the debugging process. Okay, oh, you send it out such a configuration, this version of software with this configuration on such infrastructure, and right away, the developer is able to reproduce something, for example. So the, the quality of the system can very fast be much better, but you need to start from automation from day one, not after you build the system from day one. So, so, so what does yeah. a cable operator do? Like what, if you're a cable operator today, listening to what we're talking about, how do they start that automation process? What, who do they go to? Who do they talk to? Well, Actually, you can start with, okay, you you do something small like field trial, that's that's enough. Let's say you have RPDs or real MacFi devices, um, FM, whatever, FMA or remote file. You need to have a, some software stack or some repository where you are having all the configuration. You need to start there. The, the, and the most important thing, I think, uh, thing is you never, never do a manual change in the network function. You don't do SSH to CLI on the Mac manager or CVCMTS. You don't do it. You go to the repository, you need to have a, a some software component. You can be build your own. Probably most of the operators are trying to build that by them by themselves. And I'm not saying that's the bad way. You can buy something from the shelf. There are also some products on the on the market, sometimes very big, and right away there is a problem with configuration that. But nevertheless, you have a a central place where you have a config for this particular deployment, whatever stage of the deployment, and you never, never, ever send the configuration directly to the device, but from that system. So you need to build uh, some tests for that config. You need to build some API. If you, if there is no on platform, there is no API and only SMP. Well, that's that's what you have. Okay, but nevertheless. You never ever do a direct communication network function. So VCMTS or Mac Manager or Load Balancer, you never look to the web GUI and change something in, in, in any stage. You have a one place where you're keeping all the configuration, 
and you have additional software stack when detects that the change is happening, takes the change, take the configs, compare it, for example, run the test if the config is compliant with some model, and then push that to the to the system. Then you can try to automate the, the rollback, um, debugging, etc. You start with Futura and you take ops. You take ops in that place. You you take the Futura, you take the even if this is lab, you, you ask ops, hey ops, come here. Look, we are building such a thing. Um, you see, here's a button. Never go to the, the, the directly to the function. <laughs> this, this, you need to use that. That's a new tool. A bot, you will get this and this and this. And never, even if you are like there is a fire, never do a manual change because and in infrastructure as a code, there is a, a loop of fear. Like I'm in hurry, I would do change manually. I don't trust my automation. So right away uh, there is inconsistency in the in the in the configuration of the, of the infrastructure, whatever that's CMTS and Mac Manager, load balancer, etc. So I don't trust my automation for the deployment. So I'll do manual. Yeah. So every time the the infrastructure should be represented in some config that they are in one place. But let's say that the, the whole infrastructure blow out. If you have that repository. No problem. You just can spin out a, a new one in other place, and you uh, have exactly the same. No, some Excel or Word uh, configs uh, templates, but repository for whole deployment. And you can start copying them, cloning. Like here's a deployment for ten RPDs. Here's a deployment for hundred RPDs with this amount of of of, of channels and. There are some scenarios where you can have direct inter interaction with VCMTS. For example, there is RPD that I don't know went out with some strange uh, stage or sorry state, and you need to reboot somehow this. Yeah, this is a I would say a scenario when actually you can try to execute RPC and reboot RPD because RPD should be stateless, so it should reboot and then connect to core and get the info configuration again. So. And you didn't change the configuration itself. You only changed the state of RPD itself that after the restart, it should come back to the state that was previously from, from the start. That now, I think you have a, a nice slide here that talks about a, a, once you have this automation in place, a, a really good pipeline for testing oh. your environment, staging your environment, and, and then taking it oh, into production, yeah. right? That's, that's, that's actually, this is something that is also coming from, um, uh, well, the cloud providers, everybody say, oh, cloud providers are very specific uh, providers and CA, communication service providers are different. Actually, the, the, the slide I'm presenting is something that is used in, in production and that's mobile. And mobile operators actually are heavily pushing the, this very dynamic uh, change of, of software. Uh, their backend, their whole core is also Virtualized right now, uh, uh, all the open run is very similar to DAA, or 5G is very similar to DAA itself. But yes, um, you, you you tend to build the stages, and uh, it's called the pipeline when you are actually having a situation when there is a test stage, there is a test environment where you are doing the, all the tests, performance, interoperability, et cetera, et cetera. There is a stage where you're doing um, there are a stage where we actually are testing, smoke testing, etc. So you don't have a full production. Let's say 10% of normal system is working. Or, for example, and and um, the test environment, you have a cluster, virtual cluster for Mac Manager, but only with few CPUs and can support only a few RMDs, only for testing the interoperability interfaces, some integration with external database, etc. In the and stage we, environment, yeah. Yeah, I was going to say, and when you talk about the test environment, the stage environment, production environment, these can be um, either lab environments, or they could also be, like your test and stage environment could also be a live customer environment, correct? Because we can we can actually put uh, a test code on a virtual CMTS or an, on one RPD. Yes, yes. And most of the time, it's called a canary test, where, for example, it's coming from actually from mines when the, they use the canary, canary in the coal mine. Yeah, yeah, canary in the coal mine. So 
example for that is that let's say that you have the first two stages when there is a new version of software, you test it, everything looks for ready for testing. You you go for the and that's mostly part for the RPD test or RMD. Let's say that you have a next stage. Uh, even in performance tests, everything looks good. Now you go into prod, but you don't change on the prod when there is a 10,000 RPDs working the software itself. It's like you can, but you really want to. So okay. you deploy, yes, you deploy the parallel environment like CMTS. Uh, actually, remote file is not the best thing for that because there is some, uh, the protocol used in remote file is not very good, doesn't scale well for that application. IFMA is actually much better, but let's say that the, the protocols are the same. You could you could re redirect part of the currently working RPDs for this new version of, of, of CMTS, and that could be one or 10% or something like that. And you can see uh, if it's working, there is no, no issues with that. You can go to next stage, like 50%, and then move to 100%. And with such an approach, it's much easier also to get it back if something doesn't work. If something crashes, you only touch the small part of it. Yeah, you, you don't crash whole system. So yeah, th th that way you, you could actually achieve this situation when you could have new version, and you're like testing production, but you are not really testing production. You just you a small that. part doing a slow rollout sort of yeah you you do a slow roll and you're looking if if everything is work correctly then you speed up uh, adding more rpds more rpds and at some uh, part of that process all rpds are or rmds are on new deployment what yeah. you do then you remove the old version and prepare for the next one yeah? this is something that made me so excited from the, almost from the day one um and understanding the way that virtualization can really change the way that we roll software out or you know, roll out new versions of software in a virtualized environment, which is, you know, really impacts Doxis and, and the way that we can manage our network. So I think that's really exciting. Um, so you mentioned some, some really good suggestions so far from operators. Do you have any other suggestions that you'd have to help cable operators, you know, really overcome some of the hurdles we've talked about so far and achieve even higher qualities of service, speed, and and delivery for our subscribers while you know keeping the same quality of service that we need to maintain. Yeah, don't go on shortcuts in case of standardization for inside your network. Uh, very often uh, we see that there's uh, you could have, for example, uh, API and whatever you're having your network function like CMTS and databases and syslog, there, there's nothing to talk about because this is standardized and nobody has a problem that syslog should work that way. And there's no other vendor coming with new syslog saying, oh, we're doing something different. Syslog 2.0. Oh, well, <laughs> yeah, yeah, syslog is this and we need the service running like that. But if you are doing, you don't, you should be relentless and execute that if there is API, you want an API, try to remove CLI uh, and try to, as I mentioned, have a very good standardized model of what's uh, how you manage your software. Uh, and this is also same way for the, the physical functions. Yeah, you, if you want to have RPDs, the, this, um, the protocol between RPD and CMTS also need to be standardized. Of course, we have a, a cable apps, we have a GCP that is already mature and the model data model and there is is mature but don't leave that only on the on the vendors itself you need to be able to say that what's happening in your network that's you are accountable for that yeah? uh, msos need to remember uh, about that and i think looking at the the mobile operators there are some i hear the stories that about uh few um, um, mobile operators when they execute the or getting the from the providers big ones the mobile core the radio units they build those software stacks and they are relentless in execution like th here's the spec this not aligned with what is coming from your box fix it it needs to be fixed and if the um, vendor is saying well, 
Well, we did understand that that way. They are clarifying that and going also to working groups to clarify that in the specification. That's that's I think the the best thing that could happen if you have a standardized, remove the variations. If you want to have a reliable system, variation needs to be removed because any variation in the specification, the interfaces, some some small vendor specific thing inside, yeah, it brings value at the beginning, but if you add most of very a lot small vendor specific elements inside the 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 API, that's is vendor lock, and yeah. then you, you are square one when you are not able to add or change something in the system because you are uh, tightly coupled with this particular function. So start do the standardization, and this is something that would say and. Uh, Remove, please remove manual work when you are interacting with your network function. I, I think That's, the manual work is uh, it, is is a very a very valuable one, though it's going to be very challenging for some cable operators to do that. The standardization one, I think, has always been very important to our industry, though we have seen some drift over time. So something for cable operators to keep in mind mm -hmm. and consider. Um, yeah, but. Yeah, just on, on 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 that point, I think the you, you're it's true. The standardization was always a huge, but in the DOCSIS and FI domain, like DOCSIS and FI domain is like that was the you cannot. There's no way you, you are going to do something out of the spec. DOCSIS and FI need to be hundred percent on on the same page. It's it isn't, but it uh, it's very close to it and. Really, the, in uh, in that perspective, that 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 is executed. When the remote file was introduced, uh, I was on first, not first. I was on like ten interrupts. Uh, the the GCP understanding and standardization was very fluid. So this is something. This is a new new way. You need to think about the interfaces. APIs are actually. Something new for, I will not say new, but the amount of a new APIs like RESTCon for managing the RMDs, uh, RESTCon for managing uh, the virtual CMTS or other API, not SMP. SMP should... is slowly fading. <laughs> no, no, it no, it doesn't. No, I don't agree. I don't. I would love to see it die like slowly, <laughs> no, not slowly, fast. Yes, fast death. Kill it, kill it, SMP, but. No, it doesn't. It's like because it's very hard to to disconnect it from all the legacy equipment is supporting SMP. So yeah. it's easiest way to say, okay, the new version should support and do a backward compatibility. Yes, is the is the easiest one. Yes, there is advantage to it because you can start very quickly. But in the longer run, it's gonna hurt you very very much because, for example, from perspective of FMA or even remote five, there's a lot of additional new features like telemetry, model driven telemetry, where you could have uh, tons of data coming from RPD or RMD, and you don't need SMP. You don't need to have CMTS to be a proxy for those very important data. You, you could have uh, tons of additional data, and each of that data point is actually a visibility of what's happening in your network. Again, more devices. So, And I would love to see SMP die, really. It's like, Can't go away fast my... enough for you. <laughs> no. So. Well, um, this has been an, a really intriguing discussion because I, I do think there's going to be, uh, you know, software is really changing a lot of things. We see it in the test equipment world. We're seeing it in the in the CMTS and the DOCSIS arena. Um, I, I think it is going to drive change. Uh, it's just a matter of how we handle that change. So I think. I think, um, you know, SCT Expo is coming up in just a couple of weeks. I think it's going to be interesting to see some of the new products and changes that happen at Expo. Because mm. uh, it's, been, it's been a couple of years since we've had it um, due to the, the reasons that we all know why. Um, my question to you, are you going to be at SCT Expo? And you catch me. I don't remember our booth. <laughs> the number. Uh, uh, yeah, I need to start thinking about marketing but on the our booth yeah we're going to be there uh we're going to have our open da ecosystem so that's going to be a mac manager um where we have a mac manager our virtual core that is uh 
managing uh, RPDs, and we're going to have our test automation platform. So from our perspective, there are three major critical components to either go remote fi or remote Mac fi and Mac manager itself going to be presenting the possibility to manage RMD of one of the vendors uh, on other booth. Hopefully that will be executed. There are some wireless and nitty hacks to, to be able to open up the tunnel to, to another place. But nevertheless, they're going to have a Mac manager co controlling RMD. And the same Mac manager is uh, also controlling our uh, virtual core that is providing some DOCSIS service and monitoring of RPD. Um, and those uh, two things are going to be presented, but also we're going to have a possibility to look at our booth for our test automation framework where it's able to uh, MSO to build this environment for continuous testing and continuous delivery of new version of software where interoperability between multiple vendors is tested in an automated way. There is no manual work there. Actually, the only thing that is uh, manual is uh, looking at the uh, output of the test and saying, oh, everything green, we can move to the next stage because still this is something that is required. We still is not in, in process where even that could be um, automated. So it's continuous delivery rather than continuous deployment. But nevertheless, yeah, that, that's this third component that we're going to show. So this, this platform for testing between FMA and remote five components. Awesome. Well, I'll be sure to stop by and, and uh, check out what you have. Um, I yeah. recommend everyone else does as well. Um, I have, I'll be speaking a couple of times at uh, SET Expo. I, I think it's a top five things you want to know about virtual CMTSs. I think that's on Tuesday afternoon. I'll be speaking on PM Live on Wednesday afternoon, and I'm co author of. Uh, PNM and Docs 4.0, which I think is on Wednesday afternoon. So I don't remember the times. Just search me by name, and you'll sure. see when I'm speaking. But uh, yeah, stop by, and I'll, uh, we'll I'll be I'll be there. there. And you're gonna you're gonna touch the FDX part or in PNM or yeah. Well, we're we're touching. We are covering the FDX part on the PNM. Um, we found out there's a lot of gaps there, so that's kind of a teaser for that. But we also cover FDD. Um, so PNM, oh. we have to cover it all. So that that's interesting that you are, you are raising that. Uh, th th that's actually the last thing that I would I would recommend to change in way of working is that actually change your mentality and that's the hardest change because it's people you can change the tools, but the people are the the hardest to change. Is actually do those small tests when you test the the specification itself. If we would run a few virtual field trials without the physical functions and test how we integrate that with the backend, with the OSS BSS, you could find out the bugs in the specification much, much, much faster and actually be able to, to fix that. And we, we did that similar with the with the FMA. When we start running the, the Young model, we found out that actually it was looking good. When we started applying configuration, there was a lot of bugs there. So. That we we need to have the field trial with real operation, be able yep. to find out the bugs. So, yeah, Not nothing like the real world. Them. Yeah, the, always like uh, everything works until the production, and then it stopped to work. Yeah. All right. Well, Tudu, thanks so much for your time today. Thank I you. Covered a lot of great material. We'll see you soon at Expo, and everyone, thanks for watching. Tune in soon. Bye.